Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be here this evening, along with my cohorts, Ben Green, Gabe Gunnick, and Julianne Worden. A few months ago, we had our first destination duel, and it received a lot of positive feedback from you, especially our Monday Night Travel community. So we're back again tonight when the Amalfi Coast goes head to head with the Cinque Terre. Ben? Thank you very much, Lisa. Following tonight's destination duel, we are excited for next week's show on Athens and the Greek islands. This will be followed by Florence with Rick Steves himself on March 13th. You can sign up to join us at ricksteves.com slash MNT. Tonight, we have an active show for you and we may not have time for a Q&A session later on. Nevertheless, we always read every comment and question and invite you to use the Q&A widget on the bottom toolbar. And now to introduce the debate, I would like to turn it over to Julianne. Well, thank you, Ben. As Lisa mentioned, in tonight's show, we are debating the Cinque Terre versus the Amalfi Coast, two of the hottest destinations in Italy. And tonight's show is exciting for a couple reasons. Uh, for starters, these destinations are both great places to visit, but also this uh, destination duel was picked by our viewers themselves on social media. There's quite a few choices to choose from, and the Cinque Terre versus Amalfi Coast was the winner. And this is also a question we often receive. People will send messages to rick at ricksteves.com wondering where should we travel in Italy? Should we go to the Cinque Terre or the Amalfi Coast if we have a couple extra days on our trip? So maybe tonight's show will help you decide which one to visit. Yeah, I mean, as Julian said, all four of us think that these two quintessential coastlines of Italy are very deserving of a visit, but we have many conflicted travelers with limited amounts of vacation time that want to know which coastline should they prioritize. So tonight, as, all, um, as before, we are going to be putting on our debate hats and we are going to be discussing which of these two great coasts is slightly greater. We are going to start with an overview of the two coasts and which towns comprise them. We're then gonna go head to head in four different categories, activities, transportation, day trips, and cuisine. At the end of each category, you are going to have a chance to vote for which coast you feel is stronger in that category. And at the end, after our closing arguments, you'll have one more chance to make your voice heard in an overall vote. Each category will count for 15% and the final vote will count for 40. So even if you came in tonight with some preconceptions and preferences, we encourage you to keep an open mind and maybe split your ticket topic by topic. We also in encourage you to chime in with your opinions in the Q&A. And now without further ado, it is time for a destination duel. Dun, dun, dun. Over to you. Thanks, Gabe. Let me share my slide. Okay, so the Cinque Terre and the Amalfi Coast are both beautiful Italian coastal areas, but they're not individual cities like when we debated Paris versus London. So each team would like to give you an introductory overview of their area. So here you'll see the Amalfi Coast, roughly a 35 mile chunk of gorgeous coastline from Positano in the west to Salerno in the east. So beautiful that Roman emperors chose it for their vacation spots 2,000 years ago. And travelers in search of crystal blue waters, amazing vistas, a fantastic food scene, including the birthplace of pizza, tasty limoncello, and la dolce vita have found it here as well. Tonight, when we're talking about the Amalfi Coast area, we include the city of Naples, the Bay of Naples, the archaeological sites of Pompeii, the Isle of Capri, Mount Vesuvius and Sorrento and its peninsula. There is so much to see and do here that as a travel consultant, I routinely recommend people spend five nights and four full days. If you're short on time, of course, you can tighten up your itinerary a little bit, but there is so much more to do here than just hiking and swimming. So the Amalfi Coast is about two and a half hours south of Rome and about 440 miles south of the Cinque Terre. Naples International Airport has direct flights to Northern European cities, such as Paris, London, and Amsterdam, offering easy connections to the US. A lot of times we're asked, what's the best time to visit? 
Well, you can start visiting as early as the beginning of April when the temps will be in the low 70s. You can stretch your season out even into early November where it will again be in the low 70s. On average, the Amalfi Coast is eight to 11 degrees warmer than the Cinque Terre. And personally, I've been swimming at the end of October and the water was great. So Sorrento, the big town of 20,000 residents is a relaxing and convenient home base for all of the activities on the Amalfi Coast. Great connections to Pompeii, Naples, Capri and the Amalfi Coast Drive. Beloved by British tourists since they started coming here on the Grand Tour in the mid 18th century, Sorrento is still a tourist friendly destination sitting on a breathtaking peninsula with a lemon grove right in the center of town. Next, we have Positano, a small vertical village of about 2000 that sits halfway between Sorrento and Amalfi. It is picturesque beyond belief, daytime, nighttime, it's also famous for its fashion. Positano has its own industry in linen and designing fashion. So it's wonderful for these fashionistas as well. And hey, if it was good enough for Grace Kelly and Jackie Kennedy Onassis, it's good enough. Amalfi, further down the coast with a population of 5,000, was in fact a maritime power in the past competing with Genoa and Venice. This was the Republic of Amalfi back then. Unfortunately, a tsunami in 1343 made this area of Italy a humble backwater. But today, its mighty history is expressed by its rich culture and traditions. This beautiful church here in Amalfi Town, in an Amalfi Romanesque style, was built some 1,000 years ago and is another example of Amalfi's rich legacy. The imposing stairway sometimes serves as an outdoor theater, in fact. Visitors are directed on a one-way circuit through the cathedral complex with four stops, the cloister, the basilica, the crypt, and the cathedral. A 30-minute bus ride from Amalfi Town is Ravello, a hill town sitting 1,000 feet above the sea. It boasts two villas with beautiful gardens, Villa Cimbrone and Villa Ruffalo. Here we see the beautiful Villa Ruffalo, originally from the 13th century, with its Arabic and Norman gardens looking south. The composer Wagner visited here and was so impressed that he made his second act of the opera Parsifal based here in the villa's magical gardens. Just off the coast of Sorrento and Amalfi, the island of Capri is a delightful refuge from the Italian mainland. Besides its two small towns, one of which you see here, there is a fantastic lift up to the island's highest peak. You are rewarded on Capri with unforgettable views, crystal clear water, warm Mediterranean sun, and dramatic landscapes greet all who visit. As Rick and Fred said in their new book, Italy for Food Lovers, if you like Italy as far south as Rome, go farther. It gets even better. So welcome to Capri and welcome to Amalfi. Lisa and I are excited to have you along with us for our tour of the Amalfi Coast and all its wonders. Well, thank you, Ben and Lisa, for that lovely introduction of the Amalfi Coast. Now we will head back north to the Cinque Terre, a beautiful, mountainous towns that are tucked between Pisa and Genoa in a seductive corner of the Italian Riviera. You can see it here on the map in the region of Liguria. And the Cinque Terre offers a more rugged alternative to the beach, beachy Riviera towns down south. It's a breathtakingly scenic six mile stretch of the coastline, which was first described in medieval times as the five lands or the Cinque Terre. All right, let's take a look at those five lands now. Starting with Monterosso, then we'll go to Bernazza, then Cornelia, Manarola, and Rio Maggiore. So to start things off, we have Monterosso, the largest, flattest, and resortiest of the five Cinque Terre towns. Uh, Monterosso is known for its big, wide beach with rentable umbrellas. So if you are somebody who is a sun worshiper that just loves reclining on the beach and likes the comfort of a more standard hotel. 
Monteroso Al Mare is the place for you to set up a home base. Um, it also has an old town and a new town that are conveniently connected by a tunnel. Um, and from the breakwater, you can look down the coast and in one glimpse, you can see the entire Cinque Terre lined up in front of you. All those ravines that you see in each ravine, you have a different town all within your eyesight. Next up is Vernazza, or as Rick says, the jewel of the Cinque Terre. It is also his preferred place to stay if you are visiting. And as you can see, it's called the Jewel of the Cinque Terre due to its beauty. It has this natural harbor here, which interestingly, up until the 1970s, was used as the practicing location for the water polo team of Vernazza. And they were an extremely successful water polo team until 1970, it was required that they had to have a pool, so they had to disband, but that was an interesting fact. And much like the Amalfi Coast, the Cinque Terre does have a rich history, dates back hundreds of years. In Vernazza, its fortified towers and walls uh, date mostly from the 12th through 15th century, which is fascinating to think of people kind of scrappily living along these villages, tumbling down the cliff sides for such a long time. So it's an interesting they say that the, the people that live in the Cinque Terre are mountain people by the sea, um, which I like. You have that kind of characteristic, isolated culture but um, that you usually see in the mountains, but along the coast. Next, we have Hilltop Cornelia, which Rick says attracts hermits, anarchists, wine lovers, and mountain goats. Sounds like a great time to me. Um, because it is the only of the five towns without a port, it is the least visited, but not being so popular has its upsides, particularly for hikers who don't mind a bit of a steep trek up to Cornelia and who enjoy the relative solitude. Uh, Cornelia is also the jumping off point for Rick's favorite hike in the Cinque Terre, which we will get to later. Next up is Manarola my favorite town of the Cinque Terre. It is the most photogenic, one might say, and it's also a bit more quiet than the other towns. So it's a nice refuge after a long day of hiking. And you've seen these pastel buildings throughout the Cinque Terre. And these are actually regulated by the regional government's commissioner of good taste. And so you'll find these Ligurian pastel throughout the town. And Manarola has some of the best deep water swimming, as you can see here. This is Gabe's photo from his trip there a couple of years ago. And this just seems so nice right now, this cold Washington weather, some sunshine and some swimming. I love jumping off that rock into the water. Yeah. And it is the best town to access the cliffside uh, vineyards there, which up until the 1980s, olive oil and wine were one of the were the most popular things produced in the Cinque Terre until tourism arrived in the 80s. Finally, um, as kind of a bookend, if you have Monteroso on one end, you have the second largest city, Rio Maggiore, on the other. Unlike Monteroso, um, it is a bit, has a workaday soul, it has cheap beds, it has good nightlife, um, and the locals are proud that it has the only middle school in the Cinque Terre. Um, and all in all, oh, there we go, you have a, a grandmother with her, her grandchild, I'm assuming. Um, and all in all, I know that when I visited the Cinque Terre in 2019, I was struck by how simultaneously distinctive and cohesive the five towns were. Each one still leaps out as unique in my mind, but together they pack this united cultural punch. Um, Italy recognized this cultural, um, this cultural value in the Cinque Terre and officially elevated it to being a national park in 1999. And I know our opponents are going to talk about the variety of going from big cities to hilltop towns to islands, racing around between them. But here in the Cinque Terre, while there is variety offered, you don't come here for the variety. You come here to slow down, to be steeped deeply in a potent cultural corner of Italy. And as Rick says, the Cinque Terre is one of God's great gifts to, gifts to tourism. And Julianne and I look forward to showing you that that is the case. All right, on to our first topic. So everyone always wonders, what is there to do in these towns? And there's a lot to do in both of them. So we will start with the Cinque Terre and things to do. Let's see here. 
All right. So one of the best things to do when you're in the Cinque Terre is to hike. So we see on the map here, the red dotted line is the coastal trail. You can see that it is still open between the three northernmost towns of Monteroso, Vernazza, and Cornelia, whereas due to some falling rock, they have closed the coastal trail between Cornelia and Rio Maggiore. But all of those brown dotted lines represent an entire network of trails further up and further inland that you can still use to connect all of the towns. Um, in fact, Rick's favorite hike begins in Cornelia. It goes up to Volastra and then goes back down to Manarola. Um, some of these hikes can be difficult, but the good news is that the Cinque Terre offers hiking options for people of all abilities. For an easier stroll, Rick provides town walks for all five of the towns that show you some of the major sites and viewpoints. Also, there are easier trails like the Manarola Vineyard Trail, or there's also shuttles that can help you cut out some of the steeper slopes from some of these scenic hikes. On the other end, if you want to go even more difficult, you can go on the sanctuary trails. Each town has a sanctuary um, one or two miles up the hill that the locals used to use during pirate attacks to escape and take refuge. They're very important to the people and you can do a nice, hard, steep climb up to those. So regardless of what hike you choose, walking through the Cinque Terre is going to show you a wealth of things. I love this little, this arrow here that has my initials that somebody wrote in, GG, I did not write that, but it was just telling me to go to the sea. Um, and as I hike along, you do get these sneak peeks of secret beaches, people swimming, you get old ramparts and terraced hills, you get lovingly tended cemeteries, you get natural beauty galore, and most importantly, you get the next town on your journey. And one of my favorite things in life in general is water activities. And in each Cinque Terre town, there are plentiful water activities, whether it's renting a chair at a beautiful beach to spend the, the afternoon or the full day getting some sun and getting some water, having a drink, having a lunch, having some food, which we'll cover later. There's some perfect beach foods available in the Cinque Terre. And each town has a different um, beach or kind of rocks to offer, which if you want something a little bit more relaxed, you can go to a beach like we just saw in Monteroso. They have one of the nicer beaches, or you can kind of feel like a kid again, like these children here and jump off the rocks, climb back up with a rope. And it. resort beaches are nice. They're relaxing, but there's something special about just jumping off a rock and just having that free sensation, like when you were a kid. Even Cornelia, which is hilltop, you can go down a staircase and there's rocks that you can swim off of and sun yourself on. And that's one reason I love the Cinque Terre is that the people there made the best of whatever situation they had. They'll sunbathe on concrete slabs going down <laughs> to the water. And I think it's just kind of enjoying the simple things of life. And it might be a little bit more rugged, but it's the ambiance and the happiness they have there that kind of makes it even better. And you can also rent kayaks, as you can see here in the back, and kayak around, spend the afternoon kayaking, hike in the morning, have some lunch, kayak in the evening as the sun sets over the villages. And I think there's nothing more Italian than this man in that <laughs> neon speedo tan. <laughs> you can tell he spent a lot of time out on the water. And just north in Levanto, I think this is pretty awesome. You can go surfing. There's some really great waves up in Levanto. You could take a surf lesson, depending on the weather that day and just make your surfing dreams come true in Italy. That was kind of a who knew to me, but I think that'd be awesome. There's also snorkeling and scuba equipment uh, some companies offer. And so you could just spend all day on the water too, if you wanted. And while it's beautiful by day, it is even today also has beautiful things to offer at night. Yes. And you might not think of the Cinque Terre as the biggest place for nightlife, because it really isn't. But to me, that's uh, another reason to visit because it's, it quiets down the evening. A lot of the day trippers have left. And so it's to yourself and the locals, which down in Sorrento, you might have 20,000 people. In the Cinque Terre, in Vernazza, there's only 1,500 people and there's only 500 in the winter. So it's a much smaller, more personable experience. And 
At night, you can go to some bars, list some great bars and restaurants in the Italy guidebook, or even in Vernazza, you can go see an opera show a couple nights a week. And I think maybe there isn't too much nightlife because it doesn't have that big city atmosphere, which I really enjoy. And because everyone's so tired from their fun hiking and swimming and um, kayaking and boating that you don't have the energy to be out too late. And you can see here, you just feel snug and safe and warm in the Cinque Terre because it is kind of your own at night and you can walk along the rocks as the sun sets. I think the sun setting in the Cinque Terre is one of my favorite things. So I might bring it up often tonight. And one of the specialties in the Cinque Terre is this special Shaki Tra wine along with some biscotti, which we'll talk about more later, but that just looks like a delicious evening to me. And um, speaking of food, um, the people of the Cinque Terre also like to celebrate their regional cuisine, um, including they have festivals, um, one for anchovies and another for lemons. I will concede defeat that the Amalfi Coast is the lemon capital, but I don't want you all thinking that the Cinque Terre is lemonless. They do celebrate it. Then in the summer, they also have some great festivals for patron saints, um, including the uh, Festival of Corpus Domini, in which they um, process with a beautiful carpet of flowers. And then of course, the feast day of St. John the Baptist, which they celebrate with processions and fireworks and candles floating on the water and a big bonfire on Monterosso's Old Town Beach. So there is plenty to enjoy day and night and at all times of the year. Ben and Lisa, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Gabe and Julianne for that overview and um, initial activities list. I think we have a few uh, excellent options for the Amalfi Coast as well, wouldn't you say? So. I would say. That's good. Okay, so swimming. You know, our friend Julianne said there is nothing like swimming off of rocks and I can't disagree with her. If she wants to do that in Sorrento, we've got it here with the Stabilamente. These are the swimming, swimming establishments that are off the coast of Sorrento because Sorrento isn't known for its beaches, although it is known for its beautiful warm water. So if you wanna swim in Sorrento, this is what the situation would look like with lockers and changing rooms and showers. But then you've got swimming in Positano. Okay, beautiful backdrop for the swimming, but not my favorite. I'll tell you why. There are some little coves that if you go around by private boat, you have these beautiful private coves you can go to, or you can walk down 400 stairs, kind of like Cornelia, and you can have the private cove experience. But for my money, I would go to one of the little towns on the Amalfi Coast. This is the town of Meori. And this is great because you have the beach right at your doorstep. You have a great hotel with a beach club. This is the Hotel San Francesco. Double room in the season costs about 180 euros a night. And you've got the same lounge chairs and umbrellas, which actually I will tell you personally, for years I went to the beach in Italy and I was nervous because I didn't speak so good Italian and it wasn't part of my culture that I would go and rent chairs. Like, you know, you went to a hotel and they were just there. I wish I had those years back, my friends, because it is absolutely no big deal to go and talk to the guys at the beach and get your lounger. About 25 bucks, you get a couple of chairs, an umbrella, and a little walkway to protect your tootsies from the hot sand. So for swimming, I would say that's a great experience. But if you want to jump off the rocks, we've got that too with the Stub de Limente. Now, there's also fantastic hiking in the Amalfi Coast. There are a variety of walks and hikes for those who like to move their feet. And you see this well-marked and paved pathway here in Positano. The aforementioned uh, sort of uh, lift in Capri, known as Monte Solaro, is also a fantastic way to hike. It's a 13 minute ride up to the highest point on the island of Capri. While taking the lift up saves you a lot of effort, you can also consider hiking down. It takes about an hour to head down, not too long. And of course it's much easier and you can stop and savor every view along the way. And it's perfumed with orange trees. Fantastic. 
So you really don't need to leave town to get a serious workout in the Amalfi Coast. Uh, these are cliffs, cliff side, cliff hugging communities with steep harbor side lanes. So you can just step aside, such as you see here on this beautiful stairway and get a good hike and good exercise in uh, all by itself. So while the Cinque Terre does have excellent hiking paths between the towns and above them, I would say the versatility and range and difficulty level of hikes in the Amalfi Coast make it a great region to explore for those of you who love traversing on foot. And I would say the Cinque Terre hikes are very busy on average, wouldn't you say, Lisa? They are very, very crowded. People don't, as often at least, go to the Amalfi Coast for hiking. So there's often fewer people and it's a more peaceful experience. Some of the other things that you can do in our corner of the world, Sorrento has some great food tours that are very popular, teaching you about the different local specialties of which there are many. Or you could do a cooking class, like here's my friend Davide teaching people how to make lima, a limone gelato, gelato al limone, a dish so wonderful that Paolo Conti wrote a song about it. You can also do the passeggiata. The passeggiata is what my grandmother would have called her evening constitutional. And it's time for walking up and down the street, checking in with your neighbors, people watching, checking out the fashion and the street art and breathing in that lemony sea air. The Amalfi Coast also has a wonderful shopping situation because they make some really nice handicrafts specifically in that area. So I mentioned already that there's a linen industry and fashion industry in Positano, which you can see on the screen, and they still make sandals by hand, leather sandals. You can get those in Capri or Positano. They're also um, huge producers of artisan ceramics. So most of them are made in the town of Vietri Sul Mare, which is at the Eastern end of the coast, but you can buy them everywhere. And you wanna make sure and check the back and make sure that it's made in Italy and you're buying something of quality. Lastly, I mentioned already that the British uh, tourists came here in the 18th century and they loved taking home these souvenirs, especially Victorian times, these beautiful cameos that were made out of seashells. And this tradition and artistry still remains. And then lastly, I wanted to remind you all that with the tradition that they have of classical music in the cliff top, hilltop town of Ravello, they have a music festival that goes from July to September and they have them at all time of day. And you can see that this is an absolutely breathtaking place to listen to music. Now, Ben? Yes, absolutely. I get to talk to you about the very essential activity of going down the Amalfi Coast and exploring its many shores. This in itself is a great activity. Uh, it's three hours by car from Sorrento to Salerno, and the section from Positano to Amalfi or just past Amalfi is the most scenic. So you can drive on the Amalfi Coast and enjoy its surroundings or you can enjoy the view. You cannot do both. And we'll talk more, Lisa, about the best ways to go down the coast, but uh, it's best to have someone else do the driving. Sit on the right side when going south, sit on the left side when going north, so you have the best seaside view. The road from Sorrento to Salerno is centuries old and took 150 years to build. You'll traverse bridges, enter many tunnels, and you'll just be completely stunned by the scenic views that you see around every corner. Now, you not only have spectacular vistas, but the other point of traversing the coast is to reach the towns along the way, like unique Positano, and here we see uh, Minori and perhaps even Maori further down. So you must travel down the Amalfi Coast at least between Positano and Amalfi when visiting the area for one of the all time greatest white knuckle drives. It's truly fantastic. And here we see beautiful Positano as well. So with that, I think it's actually time for our first vote. I know, isn't that exciting? So I think we'll stop the Bring share. It on. <laughs> That's right, bring it on. So 
which beautiful coastal region, the Cinque Terre or the Amalfi Coast, has the best activities? So this is specifically for the activities section. And here I'll prepare that for us now so our viewers can share the votes. We'll give you some time and, to enter yeah. in your selection. And Ben, I'm curious, you said that, you know, the hiking in the Cinque Terre, you can be on the trail in like two minutes. You can just walk out your front door. How long is it to get to those hikes in the Amalfi Coast? I don't even know. And no, they're, they're, they're right in town, he said. <laughs> they're right in town. <laughs> well, it depends. Think, there's, a, yeah. there's a variety. Yeah, I think both places can be crowded, but as Rick would always say, starting early or doing a nice evening hike, I think in either place, you'd beat the heat and you'd beat the crowd. So that's a good option. And, you know, I would make the point that we really talked a lot about outdoor activities here. The Amalfi Coast has a much warmer climate, so the season really does stretch longer than the Cinque Terre. So for spring, early spring, late fall, still great temperatures. I think that's really uh, a great perk of the Amalfi Coast. Well, I'm not going to, we're not going to give away the results, but this one's a nail biter. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. I'll throw in sometimes it might get too hot when you're further south <laughs> that you wouldn't want to be hiking yeah. at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. Oh, I see. That's where we're going. Okay. Well, well both the Cinque Terre and the Amalfi Coast are pro probably too hot in August. I mean, unless you're swimming, you know. Fair. I would right. say that I would rather be on the Amalfi Coast in April with less crowds and better weather than the Cinque Terre in April, which is just barely opening for tourism. I'm sorry, that is the truth. No smack talk. That's just a real hard opinion. All right, well, okay. I think the final votes have rolled in and we will roll into the next category. <laughs> Thank you everyone for submitting your vote. We have an exciting category. Well, it's not on paper exciting, but it is essential. <laughs> and that is the topic of transportation or the Amalfi Coast and the Cinque Terre. And our own Amalfi Coast will start. So let's get Are you going to say Amalfi Coast expert? I really, <laughs> I would have liked it if you'd said that. You're very knowledgeable, Lisa. Thank you, you're very kind. I would say expert. <laughs> Does it work? Hit it one more time. One moment, please. As they say in Italy, uno momento. Perfect. So we're going to talk to you about transportation on the Amalfi Coast because there are uh, a lot of different options for you. Of course, to get out to Capri, one option, it's a boat. Buy your ticket in advance if you're going to be there in July and August. If you are going into Naples or Pompeii, there's a direct train that goes from Sorrento. You can see at the head of the peninsula. So you could take a boat from Sorrento to Naples or you could take the train from Sorrento to Naples. And if you're going to Pompeii, the train stop, stop, stops right in front of the ruins. So that's perfect. And then going down the Amalfi Coast from Sorrento down the coastline, um, we again recommend, let's, we can't say this too much, don't drive. Uh, use one of the other options that we're about to explain to you, but you can go by boat or you can go by motorized vehicle. Thank you, Lisa, for that great overview. And thank you to Dave, by the way, for yes. providing these great maps. Dave, our wonderful cartographer here at Rick Steves Europe. So this really is the coast with the most, one of the great road trips as I introduced to you earlier. And therefore, well, because of its treacherous sort of uh, roads, it's best to enjoy it via another option besides driving. And we'll present some of those to you now. So there are public buses that run regularly from Amalfi to Sorrento via Positano. And this is one of the more common ways to explore the coast. They're inexpensive, fairly reliable. You can visit Positano.com for bus schedules, a great useful website. From Sorrento, the first bus leaves early and they stop late in the evening. These bus drivers are very skilled at <laughs> navigating these tricky roads. There are large windows on the bus though, to provide a great view, particularly when you're sitting on the seaside, as I mentioned earlier. The tickets are only around two to four euros. You can also buy a day pass for about 10 euro. If you have a little bit more in your wallet, if you have better or more substantial resources, I should say, you can think about hiring a private driver. 
somebody like these friendly gentlemen. These are um, both uh, Signore Monetti, uh, father and son, and you would want to reserve them in advance a few months uh, from the US. You can also um, just negotiate a flat rate with a taxi there on the spot, but you don't want to do anything with a meter. You can also um, go to your hotel. Your hotel can often arrange private transportation. So if you have the resources, this is by far the best way to drive the coast. And we recommend driving it one way and coming back by boat. Um, one of the reasons why having a private driver is nice, you can see this beautiful town of Positano. Um, I don't, can they see my mouse? Um, you see this tiny road. This is the main road through Positano and there's no place to park. I mean, parking is a nightmare. So if you have a private driver, they can drop you right at the center of town and then they drive away and you um, do your sightseeing and then you text them and they come back and pick you up. So it's super convenient that way. And then the boats in the Amalfi Coast are fantastic. If you want ferry schedules as well as bus schedules, you go to Positano.com. They do a really nice job on that website. Um, and the boats are fast. You can get from Sorrento to Positano in about 35 minutes. And they run frequently all the way th um, from April to October. And you can also buy your tickets in advance. Um, so you have no worry about getting aced out on the bus. So again, if you're there in July and August, that would be a great idea. Gabe, over to you. Oh. All righty, well, thank you so much. Um, fortunately, um, transportation in the Cinque Terre could not possibly be easier. As with the Amalfi Coast, there is no traffic, no cars, just quaint pedestrianized streets as you see here. Um, the difference is that the entire Cinque Terre from Monte Rosso al Mare to Rio Maggiore is only six miles. Um, if you really wanted to and were intrepid, you could hike the whole way from one town to the end and back in a day. Again, I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. Whereas the Amalfi Coast is situated along a 30 mile stretch of coast, that's five times longer. And that's if you don't add on Naples um, as Ben and Lisa have. Um, so it is, that means that in just six miles, you get an incredible amount of history culture and beauty in a very manageable and easily accessible area. In fact, going from the Northern to the Southern end is just 15 minutes and that is on a slow train. So the number one rule, don't take a car, either leave, if you do have a rental car, either leave it in La Spezia to the South or Levanto to the North and just take this opportunity to slow down, catch your breath and adjust to a different pace of life. In fact, on our Rick Steves Europe tours that go to the Cinque Terre, we often have a free day there and we call it a vacation from your vacation. Also in Vernazza, they talk about the um, La Vita Pigra di Vernazza, which is the lazy life of Vernazza. So simply take the time to slow down. And if you do have any questions, check in at the national park offices, which are at every train station for each town and you're more likely to see boats on the streets than cars. Yes, yes, as Gabe mentioned, there won't be a car in sight. And I think that really helps preserve the magic of the Cinque Terre. It makes me think of Venice or the Mont Saint Michel in France because these places don't have cars. You're just on feet, the oldest form of transportation for people. And there's no bustle of cars and honking of horns. There's not the stress of trying to find a taxi in this hot summer day. Instead, in the Cinque Terre, you can just hop on a train from town to town, which as Gabe mentioned, it's only 15 minutes from the northernmost to the southernmost town. And if you miss a train, you can just wait 10, 15 minutes for the next one, hop on that one. And so it's very ease of travel. You don't have to worry. You won't be overwhelmed. And you know that there's an exciting town just around the corner waiting for you as you're on the train. It's easy, as Gabe mentioned, there's kiosks, you can buy tickets on your phone. They, since it's a national park, there are little park stations kind of at each train station where you can learn more uh, what's coming in the next town. 
And so I think just the ease of just being able to walk up, buy a ticket, you get up late in the morning, you know, there's going to be a train coming. Train schedules are, are posted all over the towns, as everyone knows that people are going to be asking when is the next train coming. So they get ahead of that and just post them. And Rick calls them milk run trains. And uh, look how happy these tourists are <laughs> as they go from town to town, having a blast not worried about the expense of hiring a driver or the stress of trying to find a car along as you're driving along the cliffs. It's a relaxed way to travel. Also boats, there's also boats between uh, the towns of the Cinque Terre, mostly in the high season when the weather is better as they can be canceled if it's a little bit stormy as they're smaller boats. But if you prefer to have a scenic view as you go along seeing the towns as you zip along on a boat, then boat travel is also an excellent option, especially on a nice day in your keep on traveling t-shirt as we see this person here. And they're not too expensive. You can even get day passes if you prefer, if you know you're going to be doing a lot of traveling between the towns, or you can kind of combine a hike and then a train ride and then a boat ride too, if you wanted the trifecta in the Cinque Terre. But at the end of the day, the best way to experience the Cinque Terre is on foot. Again, you can hike between the three northernmost cities along the coastal route. And if you want to go up into the higher trails that I mentioned before, you can connect all of the cities on foot. These trails are not a cakewalk. Um, they are going to be rewarding. You will have a satisfied fatigue by the time you reach to the next town and get your drink and a snack. Um, but really, once you put on those good walking shoes, just follow the street signs, um, or rather not street signs, the hiking signs to the next village. I love these. Some of them are very professionally done. Some of them are artistically crafted and some are a bit rustic, but all of them will get you to your next destination. And as we said before, while trails can be busy, they are popular with people that come in from cruise ships. They will be busy during the day. But if you either go to the trails higher up or if you make sure to start your trek either first thing in the morning or in the evening at sunset, you will find that you have plenty of space. All right, now that we have had a chance to hear about the scenic hikes and cliffside drives and gentle train rides of these two great coastlines, we are gonna put it to another vote. We would like to know which of these two places do you think seems easier and more scenic to navigate? And we are going to start that vote right now. So take a moment. Which do you think seems easier and more scenic to navigate? You know what I love about the boats in the Amalfi Coast? They start at seven in the morning, unlike the Cinque Terre where they don't start until 10 a.m. You can't get know. up early and get on a boat. Waking up at seven sounds kind of early when I want to just have my nice, relaxed Italian Riviera lifestyle. You say it. But the you, boats you, also you, don't have as far to go in the Cinque Terre. Just you have to get up early, out. though. You, you have to get up early, though, to hike without a lot of people on the trails. That's true. Out. Well, I'm a night owl. I'd go for a nice sunset hike. I told Gabe once I'm a day worm, so I'd be up <laughs> early, too, <laughs> to catch that boat. Or I'd be up early just to pop right up onto the trail to beat the crowds in the Cinque Terre, too, and train back I, for breakfast at nine. I like that the Amalfi Coast has more options for people of all abilities. Mm. Okay. I mean, there's there's great town walks in the Cinque Terre, and you can go on the nice Manarola Vineyard Walk. Um, all right. I'm seeing that the final votes are trickling in. And so with that, we are going to transition to our next category, the one that I am most eager to look into, and that <laughs> is cuisine. So um, when we travel, we don't just experience cultures through its artwork or its music or even conversations with locals. We also connect with a culture through our palates, um, through its cuisine, through the crops that are grown in its soil and perfected by the people of that region over generations and generations. And perhaps no country in Europe is better known for the quality and authenticity of its culinary traditions than Italy. So we are going to get a taste of what regional cuisines the Cinque Terre and the Amalfi Coast have to offer. 
So starting off with the Cinque Terre, Julianne, take it away. Well, as I mentioned earlier, up until the 80s, the Cinque Terre produced a lot of wine and olive oil, as you see here. But then tourists arrived in the 80s and it became, tourism became the most popular thing. But the Cinque Terre, five small villages, but the birthplace of an extremely mighty food what would you even call it? A sauce, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It defies definition. Yes. Pesto. This little, these little towns are responsible for the creation of pesto because basil does so well in the Ligurian climate um, that it's perfect for growing pesto. And then they threw some pine nuts in there, ground it up in and cheese, ground it up in a porter and mestel, mortar and pestle, and <laughs> created pesto. And you can have it on pasta, of course, on pizza. There are two types of pasta that it's meant to go with. It's called, oof, my pronunciation, trinette and trophie. Uh, those are the two pestos, or the two pastas that are meant for pesto. Really good with tongue twisters. There is. <laughs> That's the, pesto yeah. with my mortar and pasta. Yeah, <laughs> for pasta. Yeah. And the frutti di mare, or fruit of the sea, is popular than Cinque Terre, as it is in pretty much all coastal towns and restaurants there can have take pride in their fresh seafood that you get to enjoy at the end of a day, the day. Anchovies are another big one in this region. They have them on many dishes. They're prepared in many ways. Lemon is always a good way to enjoy them. And if you're not that interested in anchovies in the United States, I recommend trying them in the Cinque Terre where they're fresh and they know how to prepare them well. And one of Rick's favorite dishes, I think, in all of Italy is to have the special regional wine called Shakitra. It's a sweet uh, wine produced in the Cinque Terre. And what's interesting about Cinque Terre wines is that they're challenging to produce because you have those vineyards stacked upon the cliffs there. And in the olden days, people had to go up and down with small baskets. I think some people still do to harvest the grapes. And a shakitra requires a lot of grapes to produce a little bit, little bit of wine. And it's sweet. And one of Rick's favorite things to do is to take some biscotti, as you see here, and you dip it in the dessert wine. I've never done this before, so this is kind of fun. And then that would be Cheers. Cheers. That would be your dessert for the evening. Mm. Mm. Rick says in a different episode, I believe it's on France, in, on France, but um, he says that a good wine, the grapes need to suffer. So uh. having to scrap a hard living on those terraces makes for good wine. Yes. And I just asked Rick last week, we were talking about this show. I said, do Italians really dip their biscotti in the wine? He said, oh yeah, that's what they do. So. <laughs> And here's a picture there. And while we don't have a picture of this delicacy, because the picture just wouldn't do it justice, we have some focaccia. Focaccia is also from the Ligurian region, and it is a pillowy, delicious bread. And they make the dough in a just a flat dish. And then you take your fingers and kind of puncture holes in it. And there's usually coarse salt over the top. And I don't want to say oily, but it is, in a sense, it's oily mm -hmm. and it's fluffy. It's delicious. You'll see a variety of toppings at a variety of bakeries in the Cinque Terre. And I think it's the perfect hiking snack. It keeps well. If it gets smushed a little bit, that's fine. Maybe it'll just balloon back up because it's so pillowy and delicious. But it's a great carb as you're hiking along. It is pillowy indeed. I mean, I could fall asleep on it. Yeah. So <laughs> while Julianne digs into her focaccia, um, I'm going to talk about food experiences in the Cinque Terre. And the most obvious place for food experiences is the restaurants. There are so many restaurants that proudly serve the Ligurian specialties um, in their own unique twists. Um, we have, and oftentimes, you don't have to be at a fancy restaurant in the Cinque Terre to get an incredible view with your meal. In Monteroso, um, at the Ma uh, Torre Aurora restaurant, it actually only has outdoor seating next to an old tower um, overlooking the bay. Um, also in Vernazza, here we have the smiling staff of the Ristorante Al Castello, the castle restaurant, which is at the base of Vernazza's castle. So if you wanna admire a castle while you eat. You can grab something sweet in Cornelia. There are some infamously warring gelaterias that want your business. Um, and we recommend at Alberto's, getting the miele di Cornelia, the honey from Cornelia flavor, flavored with locally produced honey. 
You can try new things in Manarola. You can try black pasta seasoned with squid ink at the Trattoria del Billy. And uh, you can get to know the locals. You can grab a snack of deep fried seafood and a paper cone at Il Pescato Cucinato, uh, where Laura fries up her husband's catches from the day. Uh, furthermore, there are also uh, a wide variety of food experiences in Bernazza and Monteroso. You can go to weekly markets to get fresh produce. You can take a vineyard tour. In fact, um, the Boranco Agriturismo in Monteroso uh, does uh, vineyard trekking where you're given a, a picnic basket and an audio guide and you do a tour of the vineyard and then sit and have your picnic. And in Manarola, you can do a pesto making demonstration. Uh, so you can enjoy not just eating your food, but creating it in the traditional ways as well. Ben and Lisa, over to you. Well, thank you. All you had to do was say focaccia and uh, <laughs> I was there. And uh, Lisa makes a good focaccia. I had Thank to take a picture behind the scenes because both Gabe and I stacked our biscotti <laughs> on top of our wine glasses. <laughs> okay, I'm hungry for actually some some food from the yes. Coast. I know this. Well, is. it's yeah. If you're hungry now, it's not going to get any worse. It was killing me this afternoon to do all these photos. So um, there is no argument. None of us are going to argue that these destinations have incredibly fresh seafood. And my dear friend Julianne said the words to remember are fruity di mari, fruits of the sea, which means that's going to net you a great variety of fish and shellfish. But I am forever grateful to the Campania region for my favorite seafood pasta dish, which is spaghetti alla vongole. And it is nothing but the freshest clams parsley, white wine, and garlic. Um, you will find it all over Italy. It's one of the more popular dishes, but it did originate in, um, in Campania. Now, the other thing that is so important to Italians that it's actually DOP, which means that it's protected, the quality is protected by the government, is the mozzarella di bufala, the water buffalo mozzarella. And these water buffalo live like kings. You can see they have their fans who come and visit them. They have machines that they can stand next to that will massage them because they give them um, the best milk. And water buffalo mozzarella is higher in calcium, protein, and lower in cholesterol than cow's milk. So, and it is going to show up on our dish later tonight, visually or virtually, um, because it is the, the most important ingredient in uh, insalata caprese. I want to, before we go on, I just wanted to show you people making the mozzarella by hand. And you can also, if you, if we're talking about picnics, if you want to grab um, bocconcini, which are little tiny balls of mozzarella, but you have to try water buffalo mozzarella while you're in Italy. Oh, mouth watering. Thank you, Lisa. And as Gabe mentioned, while the Cinque Terre does have lemons available, lemons are ubiquitous on the Amalfi Coast. In fact, uh, here you see several different varieties ranging in size and color. Many stores bottle their own and serve samples. And of course, there's the delicious, fantastic limoncello. And uh, we are going to Share some Italian. We have some show. more. Okay, yes, that seems more. like a great idea. Thank so you so. always serve it cold, and everybody in the area of Campania, the Amalfi Coast, they're going to make their own. So we have some store bought. Some here we've been keeping it in the freezer to keep it cold. But if we were Italian, we would just make this ourselves using somebody's grandma's recipe. Salute. Salute. That, that is, tastes like Italy. Yeah. Italy in a shot glass. Fantastic. So pizza is also from this region. It has a very long history here. Pizza dates back more than 2,000 years, in fact, well before tomatoes and tomato sauce arrived in Italy and it's used on pizzas. Many people in this region actually drink beer or mineral, mineral water with pizza, rarely wine. And Nepalese pizza, which is the nearest big city closest to Amalfi Coast in the same region, is so highly prized that there is a certification 
for true Nepalese pizza. Pizza crafters from around the world travel here to get a certification that they can make true proper Nepalese pizza. In, Go ahead. In particular, we recommend pizza margarita that you see here with mozzarella, like what Lisa mentioned earlier, San Marzano, tomatoes, basil, and olive oil. And in fact, that is something we are enjoying. We're going to enjoy. We didn't because we wanted to keep it for you, so it was all intact. Later, we will. Munch it. Yeah. Although in Italy, it wouldn't be sliced. Is that right? No, Lisa? it wouldn't be. We would, yeah. This would be for one person, right? and we would eat it off the plate with a knife and fork. But I'm willing to share with you. So are you do you, hey, we should have it. Yeah, yeah, okay. we'll, have it. We'll, yeah. well, well, Gabe and Julian are talking. Yeah. Enjoy our pizza. Um, do you know that the tomatoes in the Naples region are so fabulous because they grow so nicely in the volcanic soil of Mount Vesuvius? I did not know that. Huh. Well, something. All right. And also native to this region is the insalata caprese, literally the salad of Capri. Similar ingredients. Uh, we have fabulous mozzarella again, tomatoes, basil, and a drizzle of olive oil. Simple, but simply fantastic, and a great representation of cuisine of the Amalfi Coast. Now, I do like to splash out when I'm on vacation every once in a while, and this is a fairly affordable, but Michelin-starred restaurant. This is my friend Pepe. He owns the restaurant Il Buco in Sorrento, and he is showing us uh, his cheese plate. Um, there is a lot of fine dining. It's really a very happening foodie scene in the Amalfi Coast. They have almost 40 Michelin starred restaurants in, uh, in the area. So, but you can get a tasting menu here. I checked the price today for 65 euros. You can get a four or five course meal. So I would highly recommend that. Now, it is time to vote. What, let's see, I do it, thank you. Um, the cuisine vote. So which Italian region would you most want to visit to sample its mouth-watering cuisine? Please choose now. There should be a third option, both, to be yeah, honest. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Oh. And I was thinking you guys have lemons over the Amalfi Coast and they're a big deal. But I say, if life gives you lemons in the Amalfi Coast, come up to the Cinque Terre. I'll give you some focaccia. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit the Cinque Terre has better olive oil. That's, That's all. true. Yeah. Which I don't know. Put I'm, fabulous tomatoes. I'm never dipping cookies in milk again. It's delicious. <laughs> I think it's one of my favorite desserts as well. <laughs> Dip them in wine. Leave this out for Santa at Christmas. <laughs> the, the mozzarella from Buffalo, that is... So amazing. I had no idea. It's the, that's the massage machines that crack me up. <laughs> we go there on our Southern Italy tour. It's, it's just like, they're just running themselves up and down the machine. Anyway, what else about food? So we're going to have our pizza. I'm pretty excited about that. Or limoncello. You can see we've had, we we've had, had some of it, but okay, no, we <laughs> haven't had all of that because this was the same bottle of limoncello that I bought when Ann Long and I did the Amalfi Coast episode a few <laughs> months ago. So I just don't want people to think we're dipping well, that far. Gabe and I right. can't have too much sock shocky tra because apparently it's 18% <laughs> alcohol. So just a small pour. <laughs> okay, we'll end this poll and we will stop the screen sharing. And um, now we're gonna talk about day trips. So you're in these fabulous places, but you want to go a little bit further afield. What are your day trip options? Well, starting with Amalfi, because it's our turn, um, you've got quite a few options. So let's go to that. Um, we showed you how to get around. So it's easy to day trip to any of these places um, without having to rent a car. So we mentioned that. And I mentioned already that from Sorrento, you can take the Circumvesuviana train, cost you about seven bucks. It'll take you right from Sorrento to the Pompeii ruins. And here we have beautiful Capri, which we've mentioned a couple times 
earlier. It's just a short boat ride from the mainland. From Sorrento, you can get here in 30 minutes with the fast ferry, or even faster, 25 minutes with the hydrofoil. So Capri is often a day trip, but you can stay overnight. If you do make it a day trip, it's great to go early because it does get crowded in the middle of the day in high season. But as you see, it's absolutely gorgeous. Now, cute Capri town offers a fabulous shopping street known as Rodeo Drive. You can just wander through past tempting waffle cones, fancy shops and villas. It's good for the window shopping. like yeah, Window licking. Yeah. yeah, of course. And taxis in Capri are widely available and quite affordable, and they can be a fun way to get around. As you can see this uh, convertible taxi here. The price from the marina to Capri town is just 17 euros. And from the marina to Ana Capri, the second town on the island, it's 23. You can also hire a taxi by the hour for 70 euro, or maybe you could even negotiate a lower price. And what I would do on Capri, because I love doing this on islands, is rent a scooter. Ooh, you're brave. Yes, even a 50cc scooter. Uh, you can rent for only about 15 euros an hour. So I think that's a, a fun activity on the island. And, you know, ultimately, many of Capri's sites are free, like soaking up the views from the many ledges surrounding the two towns. Just absolutely spectacular. A great experience on Capri is the boat circle tour. It's inexpensive and comes with good narration. There are a few different companies that uh, provide this service taking you past caves, cliffs, and other sites. It's about an hour. There's a live guide. Um, other stops on the tour include a solar-powered lighthouse, tiny statues atop desolate rocks, and you also hear stories of fabulous celebrity-owned villas on the island as well. Now, a highlight of Capri is taking a short ride on a dinghy through a three-foot-high entry into a cave known as the Blue Grotto. The experience getting there, going in, and getting back is a scenic hoot. On the tour, you'll see dramatic livestone cliffs. And when it is time to enter, you your rower will elbow his or her way through the entrance and then pull hard and fast on a line. And depending on the lighting, there's a spectacular blue. That's why it's called the Blue Grotto. So also in the area, uh, an important day trip would be to visit the ruins at Pompeii. When nearby Mount Vesuvius blew its top, it froze Pompeii in time. It's forever 79 AD. Tragic for the 20,000 inhabitants, unrivaled archaeological insights for visitors today. The most important works of art are in the museum in Naples, which you'll see with Ben in a moment. Um, but armed with a good guide or audio tour, we can walk in the footsteps of Romans. We can see frescoes for house decorations. Because there are so many intact buildings walking through the streets of Pompeii, it's pretty easy to imagine how a Roman merchant would have lived, thinking about where he would have stored his olive oil or his wine that he's selling, um, the community bread oven, which is explained by a wonderful local guide. Um, but for more Pompeii treasures, you have to go into Naples. Oh, there's, they're keeping their feet dry. They're walking across the street on Roman blocks to keep the feet dry from when they opened up the, the gutters. Thank you, Lisa. Pompeii is absolutely fascinating. So here we have Naples, one of the largest cities in Italy. Just a, a really easy and fantastic day trip from the Amalfi Coast, about an hour from Sorrento. As Rick says, it's zesty, not gritty. Before Italy's unification, Naples was one of the country's richest cities. And today, it surprises with fascinating churches, underground Greek and Roman ruins, fine works of art, excellent pizza, and great pastries as well. So Naples' vibrancy is what really impresses visitors. This is one of Europe's most densely populated cities. Throw in an Italian way of getting out and communicating, along with a few visitors, and you have lively streets that offer a lot of spontaneous entertainment. All of your senses will be activated visiting Naples. The pulse of Italy throbs here. While Naples has a reputation of being a little rough in places, it has improved significantly in recent years. 
but it does retain a bit of an edge that I find quite appealing personally. Buildings in Naples represent a variety of architectural styles from Gothic revival to Art Nouveau. This beautiful former castle now houses government officials and the Civic Museum. The views over the bay from the upper terraces of this building are fantastic. In many ways, Naples' crown jewel is the Archaeological Museum, one of the world's greatest museums of ancient art, in fact. The tangled Toro Farnese tells a remarkable Greek myth, this statue you see here. It's 13 feet tall, making it the tallest ancient marble group statue ever found and the largest intact statue from antiquity. One of the more famous statues as well at the museum is of Hercules. He leans warily on his club. This 10 foot masterpiece is a third century AD copy of a fourth century BC original. This statue was once housed in Rome where for centuries tourists admired it. Louis of France, I forget which Louis, but one of them actually made a copy for Versailles and nobles everywhere made knockoffs in their gardens. So Naples, uh, easy day trip from the Amalfi Coast and really offering the big city experience that uh, is hard to beat. And with that, I think we can turn it over to you. No, we oh, have one more We have more one more. I, I, yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a bit further afield. This is about two and a half hours each way from the Amalfi Coast. But this is one of the most intact, important Greek temples um, anywhere, Greece, Turkey, Italy. Um, so this is something, and it's never crowded. There are these the temples out in a field and it is called Paestum, P-A-E-S-T-U-M, Paestum. You could combine this with a trip to the water buffalo mozzarella farm. That would be a good day. Fantastic. The diversity of day trips from Amalfi, incredible. Hmm. All right, sorry, I was just, just finishing up some, <laughs> some focaccia there. Um, well, um, the Cinque Terre also has some fantastic day trips from it, starting with the Italian Riviera. Yes, and I mentioned Levanto earlier, which there you can go surfing. Rick calls it a little bit more of a sleepy town than the other ones, but it's just a quick train ride north from the Cinque Terre. And you can even bike ride around some other beach towns if you like, and just kind of get a different sense uh, from the Cinque Terre if you're looking for something new to do in a day. You can also hop along to the Sestri Levante, another beautiful town with that Ligurian pastel and some other beaches. And I think one of my favorite things to do is just explore new places. And in the Ligurian region. It's just so easy to hop from place to place. Within a day, you can explore multiple new places and then feel really fulfilled at the end of the day of sightseeing and get some pastries along the way. Mm -hmm. Another one is Santa Margarita Ligure, by pronunciation. But look at these beautiful towns. This is a more resorty one if you're looking for that resort feel. But you can walk along the water, just kind of bask in the sun and embrace the Italian Riviera scents. And if you want to get off of the Riviera for a while, you, you've had your time in the sun and you want to explore some culturally rich cities further inland, um, there are a couple blockbusters within a short train ride. You have Luca, which is within a two hour train ride and Pisa is within a 90 minute train ride. Uh, most people know Pisa for its leaning tower of Pisa. But many don't know that that wayward tower is part of a larger complex that includes a cathedral and a baptistry that is part of what's called the Field of Miracles, the best green in all of Italy. And a lot of people are unaware also that this entire Field of Miracles is in a vibrant modern city. Um, Pisa has a great university with a lively student population. And so even venturing beyond these main sites is going to be very rewarding. Luca, meanwhile, does not have a lot of blockbuster sites to um, write home about. What it does have plenty to write full books about, though, is its quintessential Italian charm and its easy living. Um, its most notable site is probably its Renaissance era city walls, which are still topped with gardens and are perfect for a bike ride or for a walk. Um, in fact, they even have trees growing on top of their towers there. 
Um, and it's just a place that has plenty of markets. It has concerts of the, with the music of hometown composer Puccini very regularly. Um, and it just has nice uh, cooking classes and biking and pedestrian boulevards to stroll. Now, if you were intrigued by the hiking and swimming in the Cinque Terre, uh, you don't need to venture far beyond the Cinque Terre to find those dialed up to 11. So if you like hiking, um, I will say there are a couple, there's a regional park and a national park that you can get to. These are places where you would want a car. So if you parked it either north or south of the Cinque Terre, pick up that car and within two hours, you can be in the regional park of Alpi Apuane, um, and which has many beautiful hikes and is also known for its Carrera marble quarries, which you can see here. A bit controversial lately, but certainly interesting. Um, oh, not there yet, because the other park that you can get to is a national park that I'm gonna need my notes for, because it is the Apennino Tosco Emiliano National Park, um, which has everything from grasslands to mountain peaks to inland lakes to waterfalls to bilberry moorlands. Um, I don't know what a bilberry <laughs> is, but if you go there, come back and please let me know, because I'm intrigued. And for you swimmers, um, if you want to uh, do some underwater exploration, um, in nearby Portofino, there is a diving center that often offers scuba expeditions to a number of shipwrecks, and most famously to this very expressive underwater statue that is called Christ of the Abyss. So from alpine peaks to underwater abysses, the Cinque Terre can be your springboard for excellent outdoor adventures of all altitudes. And I think one of my favorite things about doing day trips from the Cinque Terre is that you're returning home to the Cinque Terre where it's quiet and it's nice and you can relax after a long day of touring. And even the day trips are, there are some big sites like Pisa. You can go out to Pisa where it's crowded and then come home in the evening to a cozy Cinque Terre. And nothing will be overwhelming. Everything is just kind of pleasant. And when Gabe and I were researching day trips for this presentation, we were just kind of looking on Google Maps in the area. And we looked up, I looked up, I was like, oh, Portofino, that looks neat. And then we, I zoomed in on, this is what Portofino looks like. Just, it's about an hour and a half uh, from um, public transportation to get up there from La Spezia at the south end. Beautiful town. But I just zoomed in on the Portofino Peninsula, I'll call it, and Google pulled up all these different things to do. I thought, wow, we want to go there. There's hikes, Christ of the Abyss, which Gabe just mentioned is over here. You can hike around. There's abbeys, there's sites, there's museums. And we're like, this place is awesome. And so I started researching all the different things to do. And then I thought, well, I'll just look in the guidebook to see if Rick covers this. And lo and behold, Rick not only covers this little Portofino Peninsula, but he also has the Portofino Peninsula Grand Tour directly from the book. So we thought, of course, he would have it in there. And so this is the Portofino Grand Tour. I'll read it quickly to save time. He says, for a one-day Grand Tour of the Portofino Peninsula, this is in the Cinque Terre chapter as a day trip, enthusiastic walkers can follow this plan. Take an early boat or bus from Santa Margarita Ligure to Portofino, have a quick look at the town, and then hike 2.5 .5 hours to San Frutuoso. Reserve a spot in advance at the private beach, bring your swimsuit. You'll have the rest of the afternoon to enjoy the beach, visit the abbey, eat, and perhaps see the Cristo underwater there. To finish your tour, take the 30 minute ferry to Camogli, where you can catch a train for the short ride back to Santa Margarita Ligure and then head back down to the Cinque Terre. And so that sounds like a pretty amazing day to me in the sun. And it's not going to be as crowded here. The pictures I saw of some of the hikes along the coast, there was no one there. There were no, there's no people there. And there were some World War II sites as well. So you have a little bit of everything on this little peninsula just north of the Cinque Terre. Yeah, hiking trail to World War, World War II era structures. A little bit mm -hmm. of everything. And that's kind of a scene as you're hiking along. Well, All we right. have covered day trips. And so now we're battling them out. There's Pompeii, there's Pisa. Which site, in your opinion, has the best day trips? I'm curious about this one because I know the Portofino I, thing we found really sold me on really day trips. I'm excited about that one. Yeah. 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 And I think 
the Mafia Coast does have some big sites nearby, but I kind of like the more intimate sites that the Cinque Terre has nearby to visit. And maybe some that you wouldn't visit unless you happen to be in that area. A lot of people go to Naples. Yeah. Because it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't even mention the sfogliatella, which is the best pastry in all of Italy, because we didn't have a picture of it. But the seashell-shaped sfogliatella, oh, is fantastic. Crunchy with a, a custard inside. I mean... Yeah. Comma sweet division. Right? <laughs> we count focaccia's pastry. Is it bread? Bread. It's both. Bread. Yeah. <laughs> it's anything you want it to be. <laughs> it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and when I'm guiding and I'm leaving the Cinque Terre, I always have a little bit of focaccia in my bag and I eat it on the way to Switzerland and I just miss the Cinque Terre a little bit. Yeah. Well, it looks like the results have steadied out now. I'll let Gabe write them down and then we'll head on. All Ready right. Go. Well, the sun is already setting on our Cinque Terre Amalfi Coast debate. And so now we are already at our closing statements for these two wonderful places to visit. And earlier, Gabe and I were thinking, how can we describe the Cinque Terre? And I said, I was like, well, it's kind of like a family because they all are connected. They just all have a similar history, but each town has its individual character, which makes them each special and interesting to visit. But they'll also make you feel welcome. And in Italy, family is so important. And so you'll feel welcome in the Cinque Terre. And I think you'll feel safe in the evenings and comfortable and just a place where you have time to make memories at that slow, Italian pace. What do they say? Piano, piano, slowly, slowly. I think that's the Cinque Terre to me. And I mean, I agree with Julian. I certainly feel that the Cinque Terre can give you variety. It can give you access to greater variety. I mean, quite frankly, I feel like hearing the Amalfi Coast, there are, you can go to the, the island over here and the ruins two and a half hours that way. And that's exciting. But if I want to just be steeped in one culture deeply, I want to be in the Cinque Terre. I want to be in a place that has all of this history and culture in just a six mile span, somewhere where I can walk out my front door in the morning, go for a hike, have a, a coffee and a focaccia at a little cafe, looking over the sea and maybe take a train back. But the entire day, I don't hop on a bus or a train for more than 15 minutes. Um, to me, Cinque Terre is truly the perfect vacation for, from your vacation, a place to just settle, um, to, to relax, to live the good life. Um, and in the end, it's, it's not overly complicated. To me, the Cinque Terre is simply Italy distilled. Um, and that's why I think that it should be your choice if you have limited time and can't go to both of these great coasts. Um, invest in the one where you can slow down and just sip that culture. So I appreciate that you are talking about the distillation of Italian culture, because as Rick says, if you love Italy, go further south, it gets better. This is a place where more people talk with their hands, where men cover their private parts when a hearse goes by because they're very superstitious. This is a place, it's Italy in the extreme. So I appreciate the culture and the history of the Cinque Terre. You know, I've been there many, many times, um, but the Amalfi Coast has just pure Italianness. Pizza, scooters. I mean, what do you think of when you think of Italy? You don't, you know, you don't necessarily think of something so far north. So for my, for my money, I would spend time on the Amalfi Coast because it cost me a lot of money to get to Europe. I have a lot of things I want to see. And this is a place where I can see a lot of things in a small area, not six miles, but a lot of things. So Ben, you, uh, you were going to say uh, something about well, there's quite a few points I, I think that could be made. Um, the diversity of sites, as Lisa mentioned, is great. Uh, the quality of the restaurants is very high. 
more than 40 Michelin stars, I believe a bit more than the, in the Pinquetera area. The six in all of No, Rick Canada. has more recommend of his recommended restaurants in the Cinquetera. The Rick, you're saying Rick recommends more restaurants in Cinque Terre? Mm -hmm. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Oh, the Italy food book, of course, yeah. <laughs> well, your point about history, I think, is very important. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, the Amalfi Coast was a republic for centuries, and it was extremely powerful. And we didn't even fully get into it. But the history that you can find here in Amalfi of its grand past is extremely powerful. And as Lisa mentioned, uh, just when we were reviewing our notes, Southern Italy is where Italy and Greece combine into something really fantastic, like with paste done with the Greek ruins uh, and other points of history as well. So the dramatic story of the Amalfi Coast, I think is not always fully appreciated, but its history is, is very strong. And there's a volcano nearby. There's right? a volcano. We didn't even mention the volcano, really. Um, I think when you have the entire Roman Empire at your disposal, and Emperor Augustus and Emperor Tiberius chose the Amalfi Coast, that says something. They could have gone anywhere. And I do really, really love the idea of going in early April or um, early November to avoid the crowds because we can't sit here and lie to your face and say there aren't crowds. Um, there are plenty of crowds in the Cinque Terre and there are plenty of crowds in the Amalfi Coast. Although the Amalfi Coast has better infrastructure because their tourist industry has been going on for hundreds of years, unlike since the 80s, as Julianne mentioned. So I think that's an important thing to take into consideration is lots and lots and lots of people go to both these places, but which one is better able to handle it? I'm off. Uh, well, thank you, Lisa. And I would like to thank Gabe and Julianne as well. This has really been a lot of fun. I can't believe it, but it's actually time for the final vote. So Rum for all of you. <laughs> yes, I know. Da, 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 da. We need Rick with his bongos. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So this is a vote of overall impressions. Um, you know, whether you've been to these gorgeous destinations or not, which do you think deserves your vote? So I will pull up that poll now and we'll see what we get. And this this is worth a little bit more mm -hmm. than the votes yep, we've had. 40%. And again, hopefully, if you have not already been to these places, you'll make it to both someday. But which one do you want to go to first? And I think I had fun learning about both these places as we went along. The history goes back much farther than I thought. Mm -hmm. and, all right. Uh, well, while you all vote, um, I'm going to do our quick word from our sponsor for the week. Um, and for tonight's word from our sponsor, I want to hi highlight two books that this presentation would not have been possible without. We, of course, have the Rick Steves Europe Italy book, which I know at least our, time, our team used like a Bible to supplement our own experiences um, throughout this presentation. But we also have Rick's new book, um, Rick Steves Italy for Food Lovers. As part of my job on our marketing team, I have been promoting this book over the past few weeks and I just absolutely love it. Not only does it have um, Rick and his co-author Fred Plotkin's 100 Favorite Restaurants, it's so much more than a restaurant guide. It teaches you how to shop at local markets. It teaches you, here's the Liguria page. It maps out on the map which pasta types and dishes originate from these places. Um, in fact, it was recently reviewed by longtime New York Times uh, writer Floris Fabricant, and she called it um, second only to a passport uh, for new travelers to Italy. So um, hope that you get your passport first. That's important. But after your passport, this is second. Um, all right. So um, Julianne and I are going to briefly tabulate our scores. And before we announce them, um, Lisa. Do you mind if I put you on the spot? And as a tour guide extraordinaire, can you tell us now that the votes are all said and done, um, what's, what's been your favorite experience in each of these places or one of your highlights every time you're at these places? Well, I don't mind you putting me on the spot. That's very kind of you to ask. <laughs> um, I will say, being on the Amalfi Coast team, that I want to hearken back 
to the year 2000 when I was on my very first Rick Steves tour as an assistant tour guide. And I had never been to Sorrento before. I'd never been anywhere down there. And I kind of had always had this idea of the Bay of Naples as this sort of industrial, possibly polluted area. And I remember being on the street outside the hotel in Sorrento and looking across the Bay of Naples and going, this is one of the most gorgeous places I've ever been. And it passed my test, which is always, do I want to come back here with my husband or do I want to come back here with my kids? And it did. And so uh, my impression of the Bay of Naples was a, kind of a magical thing for me. You want me to keep going? Yes, they're doing math. Okay, so um, the Cinque Terre, we counted up and I have been to the Cinque Terre about 85 times in my life, uh, give or take. And so I know it very well. And I would say that one of the more special experiences you can have that I've had is you can go up to the Castello restaurant that uh, Gabe showed the picture of, of the family. They're the nicest people in the Cinque Terre because they are and have their mama's pesto lasagna because you won't find anything like it anywhere else. And um, I remember the first time when the Rick Steves tour stayed up there. If you were the assistant guide, you got to sleep in her sister's apartment, Aunt Wanda's apartment. And you only had to climb 156 steps with your luggage to get there. Um, but it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And people can go there and have the pesto lasagna and the shaki tra, and you can have that experience as well. Well, thank you very much, Elisa. I mean, your experience has been invaluable for both of our teams throughout these destination duels, and we always appreciate, especially the guide's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and we now have our scores. Scores here. It was interesting to see. As you can th see, things were neck and neck in the beginning. And then things flip-flopped for transportation and cuisine, 70, 30, 30, 70. And then day trips. Day trips and overall impressions. Yeah. They got us. Amalfi was racing ahead and overall impressions. So, and but so... the winner of tonight's destination, destination duel is... is... Oh, <laughs> I'm all be gone. Yeah, you're undefeated. Very compelling, very well researched. Ben is undefeated. So the next destination duel, it's going to be the three of us against Ben. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, then I'll pick something in Central Eastern Europe then. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Your home Poland. territories yeah. retreat to the, the Balkans, <laughs> up in the mountains, easier to defend. <laughs> oh well i, I hope like. that you all had a great time tonight this is something that honestly takes a fair amount of work for us but we love doing it so we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we liked putting it together please come back next week and see athens and the greek islands with nikki and our own julianne and um you can register for that online and then we've got actually we've got Poland coming up with you the week after that is on it? March twentieth. On March twentieth, I forgot Rick. Oh my goodness, Rick and is going to be in Florence doing Monday night travel on Florence um, the week after Nikki, and then it's Ben in Poland, and then it's um, myself in Prague. So we hope that you sign up for all of those shows at uh, RickSteves.com. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks, oh everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, Ben. Good night, Lisa. Good night, Thank Julianne. Good, Good night, Kate. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Julianne. Thank you so much. You guys are great. Good night.